and open your ears, open your minds, and open your heart as our beautiful angel in blue, Sonia Brown, <laughs> opens her mouth and brings you a message of joy, of hope, and of peace and love. Please help me welcome Sonia. Good morning, friends. Good morning. It's so good to be here. And just let me thank Carol for setting the tone of the service so beautifully. Carol, you're beautiful. <laughs> this past week, while thinking about a message for today, the passage from the New Testament which speaks about seeking the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness kept coming to me. Now, I have to confess, I'm not one of those who know the Bible from beginning to end. So I did a Google search and discovered that it is taken from the gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. The quote from the King James Version of the Bible goes like this. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The New Living Translation of the Bible says it this way. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. And from the New Standard Revised Version, but strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given you as well. I decided to read the entire chapter and found that it really is a treatise on how to live our lives. The lesson from this chapter is in line with some of the principles taught here. The three, first three verses, King James Version, go like this. Take heed that ye do not your arms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine arms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest arms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand is doing, that thine arms may be in secret, and thy father, which sat in secret himself, shall reward thee openly. The Random House Dictionary defines a hypocrite as a person given to hypocrisy. And hypocrisy is defined as a pretense of having desirable or publicly approved attitudes, beliefs, principles, etc but that one does not actually possess. Therefore, in the verses from the gospel, which I read earlier, we are being advised to be sincere in whatever we do. The motive for our charitable deeds should be pure and sincere. They should emanate from love. And it is important that they are performed not for the sake of appearance, nor to receive adulation, but because we genuinely care and have the urge to share. There should be no desire to impress anyone. They should be, be, they should be performed out of a consciousness of love, knowing that the Father within is our source, he is omniscient and omnipotent, and uses us as his channels. The arms come not from us, but through us. Therefore, 
We do our alms, our charitable, our loving deeds, as we are guided from within, without any ado. In verses five to eight, the master Jesus tells us how to pray. He says, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of our streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like them. For your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye seek them. There it is again, the reference to hypocrites. I believe the master Jesus is here telling us that we should not take our cues from the outer world, from the consciousness of the race. We are to close off the thoughts of the outer world. We go to the secret place of the Most High and we heed our inner guidance. We go to the Father within, to that pure place in consciousness for direction. In a commentary on these directives from the master, the founder of religious science, Dr. Ernest Holm, states in the Science of Mind textbook, the secret of prayer and its power in the outward life depends upon an unconditional faith in and reliance upon this inner presence. We are to shut out all else and enter the presence of spirit in quietness and confidence, believing. Prayer has power, not through repetition, but by belief and acceptance." End of quote. Dr. Emmett Fox, another New Thought minister says, we must not allow any consideration whatever, any institution, any organization, any book, or any man or woman to come between us and our direct seeking for God. Centers, churches, schools, all fill a useful purpose in providing the physical framework for the distribution of right knowledge. But the actual work must be done by the individual. End of quote. It is me, it is me, it is me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. In verses 9 to 13, the master tells us the manner in which to pray and gives us what is commonly referred to as the Lord's Prayer. I believe we are all familiar with it. He says, after this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us look at this prayer. It is an affirmative prayer. It speaks to our father. Who is a father? A father is he who serves a child. Therefore, our father has served all of us. The infinite, all-knowing, all-powerful spirit is not just my father or just your father, but the father of all of us, our father. What does that make us? It makes us brothers and sisters. 
We could say that we all have the same spiritual genes. Now, just as siblings in a particular family may have different personalities, they come from the same parents and bear similar genes. And so do all of us with our different personalities carry what I will refer to as God genes, having all been sired by the same father, the omnipotent, omniscient one. Therefore, within each of us is the Christ present, regardless of the different masks we might wear. That pure essence of love and light resides within us. In truth, then, we are all one. Anything we do to or for another affects the whole. We are told in the prayer that our Father is in heaven. What or where is heaven? The Science of Mind textbook tells us that heaven is a state of happiness. Heaven is within. The kingdom of heaven is unformed, unlimited, unconditioned. It is the real state of being. We do not make it real, for it is eternal reality. So in essence, we are praying to that which sires us from within this unformed, unlimited, unconditioned reality. We say its name is hallowed that it is holy, and the kingdom of heaven now exists. Thy kingdom come, it exists now. We further affirm that the Father's will be done, and we declare that that which is in heaven manifests on earth. We further exercise our dominion as heirs to the kingdom by requesting our daily bread, and we ensure that we come from a place of purity by asking for forgiveness in like manner as we forgive. Joel Goldsmith, who was a modern day mystic, when asked about the Lord's Prayer, that he understood full well his words, the section which says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. He comments as follows. Only that which I release can be released within me. Anything that I hold is held against me, but not by any God. It is a reflex action of my own state of consciousness. Therefore, any time that I am holding an individual in absolute, complete unforgiveness, I may rest assured that somewhere, somehow, sometime, I too will be held in unforgiveness, not necessarily by a person, but, my own, but by my own erroneous clinging to the false sense of man." End of quote. He continues, Whatever you release, you are released from. What you cling to is that which binds you. You are your own liberator. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And this means mental, moral, physical, financial freedom and freedom in human relationships. But you can't enjoy this any more than you can give of that enjoyment." End of quote. This last phrase, you can't enjoy any more than you can give of that enjoyment, is similar to the saying, as you give, so you receive. And this is true for forgiveness, as it is for all other forms of giving. You see, friends, when we cling to a false sense of anyone, we are also clinging to a false sense of ourselves. We are, in our ignorance, seeing the beam in our brother's eye without seeing the moat in our eyes. 
Forgiveness is necessary to keep our hearts and mind pure, unconditioned, free, so that we create that space for the divine ideas to spring forth from within us. We affirm that it is all the Father's kingdom, the Father's power, and all the Father's glory eternally. Not our power, not our glory, the Father's. In verses 19 to 21, the Master tells us, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Here the master emphasizes that we should not put our, our trust in material things. We should not make gods of them. Rather, we should place our faith in the eternal. Material things are transient. They are form. No matter how good the form may be, they are effects. If we interpret prosperity as material wealth and put our trust in material things, then we may be setting ourselves up for disappointment. These outer symbols come and they go. I remember many years ago when I was working in the United States, I had a client who had what would have been regarded as a very healthy stock portfolio. And then along came Black Monday, October 19, 1987. I remember it well and two-thirds of his portfolio was wiped out. Material wealth is transitory. And the person who values himself of material gains and material wealth above all else could be sorely disappointed. Quoting from Joel Goldsmith in the book Practice in the Presence, never worship effect. Never hate, fear, or love an effect. For worship of form is to indulge in idolatry. The very moment that any form becomes a necessity in our experience, we are placing our dependence, our happiness, and our joy in that instead of in the infinite invisible, which is the cause of all form. Continuing with the master's teaching, as outlined in Matthew chapter 6, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either he will serve the one and despise the other. We cannot serve God and mammon. To get a clear understanding of the word mammon, I turn to the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, and this interpretation that I now share with you got my attention. The material or worldly thought and belief regarding money, possessions, and wealth, compared with the true inner riches of the mind, the understanding and the realization of the spiritual substance, life, and intelligence that lie back of every manifestation. I don't believe this could be any clearer. We should place our faith in the true inner riches of the mind, the understanding and the realization of the spiritual substance, life, and intelligence that lie back of every outer manifestation. In all things, in all situations, we go to the indwelling presence. 
in all things we take our cue from spirit. Mr. Goldsmith tells us, the only real gratitude is that which is felt for the gift of spiritual discernment. All else is thankfulness for things. And Dr. Ernest Holmes, in commenting on this section, says, we must cleave to the good and trust absolutely in the law of God to bring about any desired end. Spirit will mold our purposes when we allow it to do so. As we learn to depend more and more upon the perfect law, we shall find that the outward things which are necessary to our good will be provided. We shall be cared for as the lilies of the field, which live directly upon the divine bounty." End of quote. The Metaphysical Bible Tech Dictionary tells us, man must become established in the truth of the one substance and one life in order to become pure in mind and body, to have the single eye or an eye single to God and truth. When we do this, we are divinely guided into right action. On the other hand, if we allow ourselves to lose focus, looking hither and thither and yon, listening to the opinions of the race, we become confused and lose our clarity of thought and action. We cannot use the outer appearances to guide our actions and then expect to reap the rich rewards of going within. Dr. Holmes and Dr. Barker puts it, it's, puts it this way, my riches are of the mind and spirit. Continuing with chapter six, verses 25 to 30. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies, of, the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet, I say unto you, that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Here we are being advised not to be anxious, not to worry and fret about how to get the everyday things that we use in our human experience. Yes, on the human level, we do need certain material things. However, the way to attain them is not from a basis of worry, anxiety, or fear. We need not coerce, manipulate, or compete with others for material reward. Remember, we get more of that on which we place our focus. So if we put our focus on worry, fear and anxiety on mani manipulation and coercion. If we get bogged down in the how to do, how to get, we get more worry, fear, and anxiety. Instead, we should place our focus on the infinite invisible, knowing that it is our source and provider of all things. It will lead us to the various channels through which it delivers all the resources we require. 
We are reminded how transient things can be. The grass of the field today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven. The suggestion is that because we lack faith, we focus on the acquisition of the added things rather than on the source of the added things. Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. There we have the answer. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take note, seek ye first, not second, not third, not fourth, but first the kingdom of God. The science of my textbook tells us that the kingdom of God is the consciousness of God. And the metaphysical Bible dictionary says that his righteousness is a state of harmony established in consciousness through the right use of God-given attributes. Truth working in consciousness brings forth the perfect salvation of the whole man, salvation, spirit, soul, and body. And righteousness, that is right relation, is expressed in all his affairs. What are God-given attributes? Some of them are love, light, peace, harmony, joy, life. Therefore, when we seek the kingdom of God and that state of harmony in consciousness through the use of love, light, peace, joy, that infinite and invisible wholeness working through us expresses as right relation, right action in our affairs. We receive all the added things. Therefore, in all things we go to the Father, not just in what we consider big things or small things, but in all things. The goal is to become so aware of the presence and the power working in and through us that we get to that stage in consciousness which Goldsmith refers to as beyond thoughts and words. At that stage, we have so embodied this, the principles that we live our life as a prayer. So friends, we work on getting to this stage using tools such as affirmative prayer and meditation. Both are taught here. I would like to end with some ideas on prayer from Joel Goldsmith. He says, prayer is the means whereby the relationship of God the Father and God the Son is established as demonstration. The word made flesh. Prayer, when it is understood, is the means whereby you overcome all material sense, material living, and bring yourself to that place where your life is spiritually governed, spiritually protected, spiritually guided, spiritually experienced. Once prayer has been achieved, there are spiritual experiences that take place within you which are your real joys and which you value the most. It isn't money that you count any longer as your wealth. No, it is the love you continuously experience which prom prompts someone to be kind to you, whether they offer you money or whether they offer you a little re remembrance or an, automobile, or an automobile ride or a meal or some courtesy on the trip. It isn't the material object at all that pleases or thrills you. It is the love which prompted the kindness 
and that you glory in, that you love, that you feel because of your oneness with the individual who brought that out, end of quote. That, friends, is true prosperity. Namaste.